my name is Angela Wilkins. I'm the director of the King, uh, executive director of the Ken Kennedy Institute. I'm really happy to welcome Sunil to speak today. Sunil is the founder and managing partner of Ubiquity Ventures, a state st seed stage institutional venture capital firm with 100 million under management. He focuses on software beyond the screen. This includes B2B technology companies that utilize smart hardware or machine learning to solve business problems outside the reach of computers and smartphones. Prior to founding Ubiquity Ventures, Sunil invested in Auth0, Zapier, Rock, Rocket Lab, Tile, Twitch, to just name a few. He's also a founder and a CEO of a VC-backed company that got um, acquired, and he's worked at Bain, Cisco, Microsoft. And he also holds his MBA from Harvard Business School and has a BS in computer science from UNC. Um, excited to see you speak today. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Angela. Uh, can you hear me okay? Give me a thumbs up if you're in good shape. Excellent. Well, I'm glad to speak with all of you. I'm glad we're recording this as well. Uh, and um, it's always nice to interact with folks from the Rice uh, community. Um, uh, we have office hours as well. And I think Angela and um, Michelle and the team will make sure that's circulated if you want to sign up. Um, but um, what I actually hope to do today is um, share a little bit more about software beyond the screen. I think it's the single biggest trend right now uh, and um, very not enough people are talking about it. So um, I will talk you through some um, slides uh, and some um, data points I have prepared and um, it's really what gets me fired up. So with that, I'll flip on my screen share right now and I believe that um, this should be working just fine. So again, the goals for today are, are really to um, convince you that uh, or remind you, I guess, first of all, that software is amazing. Number two, uh, to convince you that it's moving beyond the screen, that it is a very, very big deal that software can now um, um, move uh, beyond just a computer with a keyboard and a mouse uh, and, a, and a big monitor. Uh, and um, and that's a really, really big deal. So we'll dive right into this um, this core idea. Um, as, as Angela mentioned, I've been a VC um, for about uh, 12 years and um, most of that time I've been investing in, in deeper tech areas. Uh, prior to that, I was uh, an entrepreneur and I've been a tech nerd my whole life. So that's where I'm coming at um, as I approach these ideas is as an engineer that um, has followed sort of startup and investment trends for a little while. The, if I were only be able to talk to you for 30 seconds, this is the, the best 30 seconds of the whole talk, this single slide, this idea that software can now leap off of the screen. We, we know that software, uh, many of us are using Zoom on a desktop computer today, we know that it's had a powerful run. Uh, many companies were formed. Uh, it was, uh, you needed to hit control, alt, delete, log in, type in your password, right? That's one version, one incarnation of software. Uh, then software took a big jump uh, into our pockets, right? The screen was a little bit smaller. Um, the interaction modes were a little bit different. People started talking about snacking on apps and things like that. New companies were formed given this new modality and new engagement mechanic uh, with software. Instacart, right? You can now sort of uh, uh, talk to somebody who's at a grocery store uh, while they're buying your groceries for you. Uh, but this is, um, I also think, a little old school. Uh, to me, the next wave is that software can now be in everything, run everywhere, understand the real physical world. And um, hopefully at this point in the talk, you now know why Ubiquity Ventures is called Ubiquity Ventures. Uh, it's uh, clearly uh, a reference to this ubiquitous computing idea. Uh, and it's um, it's taken many years to get to this point. Uh, I have a deep respect for all the work behind, uh, but I think all the uh, future opportunity lies um, in this newer area of software starting to surround us. Uh, I'll make, offer another version of the same idea that might be a little more familiar. Uh, you know, Ubiquity, the, the VC firm that I run, uh, as a pre-seed seed investor, I'm focused on transforming real world physical problems into software problems. Uh, when I say software beyond the screen, you could think about it as start with the real world physical problem, like taking a photograph. Uh, that used to be a chemical process when you had a uh, point and shoot camera. Uh, then through the hard work of lots of technologists, we got um, point and shoot CCD cameras, eventually very nice SLR cameras that rivaled um, um, you know, every version got better than the one uh, before it. Uh, but this this is a uh, important trend. Uh, it's solving a hardware problem. Now, um, me at Ubiquity, uh, not focused on this at all, uh, but I, uh, I do think it's an interesting starting point that uh, we were getting um, solving a problem with better and better hardware. Very hard to do. But I get interested when instead you can solve that same problem with a software solution. And in this particular instance, um, Apple and Google have been some of the pioneers here. This idea of 
taking a really simple piece of hardware, you know, the camera in your iPhone, I don't know, it might be a dollar or two dollars, but it's paired with one trillion calculations. That's a real number. That's Phil Schiller from a talk uh, two years ago on stage. But every time you click the button, one trillion software calculations occur. It's mind blowing when you think about it. Initially, uh, this idea of computational photography, not just photography, but merge it with software, uh, would get you a pretty good photo and then a better photo. And I think today most people would agree in many situations, it's a better photo than the nicest SLR. That can sometimes be by, uh, this is the roadmap for software beyond the screen, copying some of the features, trying to uh, use software to achieve the same features as an SLR. If anyone's into photography, you know about the bokeh effect when you have a depth of field. Uh, iPhone does that with its own sort of depth sensor and then the ability to to take a, a, a particular slice and then defocus the other parts of the image. Totally different technique, but you achieve the, the, the same impact. Now though, iPhones can even do better. Uh, they can have low noise image stacking so that you can see in the dark and you can um, almost in the dark, right? Much better uh, image response than would ever have been possible with, with just uh, an SLR. So I think it's an interesting roadmap to see kind of how this all plays out slowly over time here that uh, we can use software to solve real world hardware problems. So um, if we think about software beyond the screen, um, I think we first have to rewind and talk about where it started. Um, I, uh, I think this is a great quote from Maya Angelou, uh, and uh, we'll use that to guide the next few minutes of our talk here. So uh, where did software come from? Um, I live out in Palo Alto in the center of Silicon Valley. I've been here since 2009. Um, and um, I've been involved with the Computer History Museum almost the entire time. Uh, it's, it's right next to Google in Mountain View. I was part of the board uh, for many, many years. Uh, I, I think that every time I'd walk through the hallways, and I, I still go there quite a bit, uh, I'm reminded that the way that software looks changes every 10 years, 20 years, five years. It looks totally different from jump to jump. And part of my... Uh, thrust in today's conversation is that if you miss one of these transformational jumps of software, you miss out on tremendous opportunity. Um, so software used to look like this. Um, this is one of my favorite exhibits in the uh, Computer History Museum. This doesn't look like software. Uh, but uh, the, the quick story behind this is that they were um, trying to count the US census on paper in 1880, I believe, and we're using pen and pencil. And it, there were so many people growing uh, that uh, by uh, 1887, they had barely made it like halfway through counting the census from 1880. So clearly there was something wrong. We weren't able to count the census in time to be effective. So what uh, the, the, uh, was invented by Herman Hollerith was this uh, machine that would send a current right here. You can see my cursor through down to the plate. And if there was a hole in the card, they'd have electrical contact and that would increment one of these counters here. So now you have the ability without anything too complicated to go out in the field, punch when people are different uh, ages or whatever the other demographic questions are on the census, bring them back and count really, really, really quickly. Now this might sound um, a little, uh, and, and you can, this is, um, I'm, I'm showing this as the punch uh, and on the right side is the electrical contacts to increment all of them at once, a parallel processing, if you want to call it that. This might seem kind of silly for a, a talk in 2022, but this company um, was, this was made by a company called uh, CTR, Calculating, Tabulating and Recording. And um, 20, 30 years later, I'm gonna get that a little bit wrong here. That company CTR morphed into IBM. So in many ways, this is the first IBM computer uh, and it was used uh, in, in a way that we can all understand. Uh, later on, uh, 1946, we have the, the um, women programmers of ENIAC um, at University of Pennsylvania. Uh, and, and here the software they're doing is wires. If you wanted to set a variable to three, you turned a knob to three. If you wanted to uh, pass a, a number to a function, you know, how we do it today, you moved a wire to connect the two. So in many ways, uh, what we're staring at physically is the software. So it used to be uh, copper contacts for that hollow earth machine. And then it became um, wires. And, and uh, as many of us know, this was instrumental in the war and uh, uh, trajectory computations and things like that, tra trajectory tables for missiles. Um, I uh, start, uh, you know, where I, where I was born in the picture, I wasn't alive in 1946, but I do have an intimate familiarity with this world of, you know, magnetic media, uh, whether it's a five and a quarter, a quarter or, or um, but, but, but the, the idea that you would carry software around with you, it would be written in somewhat standardized code, 
and IBM PC compatible, almost any computer could run your code. Uh, massive shift versus ENIAC custom programming or, or even any of the Bill Gates with the PDP-10, things like that. Like that was custom code. Now we started to get to some level of generalization and software looked very different. Again, if you were investing in ENIAC and you saw a little piece of plastic, you'd say, what is this? This is this is stupid. Uh, and uh, the, again, we got we to gotta look at core first principles to follow what's really going on. Eventually it became... CD-ROMs, and I put this on here because I uh, interned during college at Microsoft, and this was 2003, and I think there's an interesting element of, of software in 2003. Um, Office, Microsoft Office, uh, big organization, thousands of people work on Microsoft Office. The development cycle was such that you would think of new features for Microsoft Office, um, new buttons, new ways that Microsoft Word or Excel should work. Um, and then you would build them for nine or 12 months. Um, and then at some point you'd say code complete. Nobody is allowed to write any more new code. Then for the next 12 or 18 months, everyone's gonna fix bugs. So now uh, 18 months of thinking, building, 18 months of testing, hopefully you're getting this image that software was this delicate, brittle thing that we didn't totally understand how it works. We need to be careful with it. So 18 months of bug bashing. And then we would say, uh, 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 cut the gold master for the CD-ROM, uh, uh, release to manufacturing. So there were these monolithic steps with this gigantic piece of software. And this is why you had Office um, 95, Office 97, Office 2000, this three-year development cycle. Um, I, I bring this up because as we all know, uh, today software doesn't work this way, right? But but uh, it was a CD-ROM, it was box software, uh, 600 megabytes, you know, for everything you would need to, to, to manage your whole work productivity. Um, and, um, and that's now nowhere to be found in our world. Um, we'll skip that. Uh, and then eventually, you know, this is um, 1994 uh, magazine cover, but we started to have um, pipes, um, high bandwidth pipes into our homes. And uh, that's when we started to have some of these websites. I put this on here because it's kind of funny to think. Uh, the top left, these are real screenshots of the uh, first Google web page, one of the first Google web pages, the Netflix homepage. I mean, unbelievable if you think about it on the right side. Uh, now clearly they weren't streaming, they were, they were sending effectively CD-ROMs, DVDs in the mail, uh, but first Netflix and first GeoCities. Um, and um, so now we were having code delivered on the fly in a way now, I don't think most people would call HTML code. It wasn't, it wasn't interactive locally or anything, but we, software has shifted, right? So the, the, the wires of ENIAC to the CD-ROMs of Microsoft to uh, just-in-time delivered HTML with like web, uh, you know, um, web standards. Uh, and, um, and this is a really big deal um, that, that, again, if you thought you wanted to invest in CD-ROMs or start a CD-ROM company, now you are totally out of date. Now you needed to start an HTML company. You need to start a web server company, an ASP, uh, uh, a bunch of uh, .com. Um, and now we'll, 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 we'll talk about more, more recent times, you know, something we're a lot more familiar with is apps on our phone. So you want more time software has shifted, um, objective C or Swift, but it's also something where, um, you now get the software delivered on the fly. There's a hybrid of what's computed in the server and the cloud. People don't really say client server anymore, but it's, it is, it is sort of an interesting combination of the two, uh, heavy collaboration, standardization of two or three platforms, Android and Google, and now software looks very different, right? Um, I think famously Kleiner Perkins VC firm started a, an iFund uh, to fund apps and things like that. So uh, yeah, again, I'm trying to drive home that uh, these things look so different from each other. And now we're, we're thinking about what is the next step, right? Like is uh, how different will software really look? Um, and so, uh, I think it's, keep that in the back of your mind, sort of the, the history of software, and we'll take a, a little bit more of a technical dive into um, some elements of software development, because I think it's an important compass to, to see where things are going. So um, my dad was a coder, I'm a coder, I think we, this, the, the software development tool set, the way we build software, is actually pretty incredible. Um, I think there's, there's a few pillars of software development I would postulate here that, um, that uh, we um, benefit from. So every developer, it's just in the ethos that you always try to reuse stuff as much as possible. It, is, it makes no sense to try to sort of reinvent the wheel. Um, there's this Isaac Newton quote about standing on the shoulders of giants. So that's an important piece of the puzzle. We're gonna go deep into each of these. Uh, abstraction, if a problem is complicated, work on a small piece and then assume someone else will solve the rest. I mean, that might be you, but you're sort of stepping piece by piece, separating the problem into uh, different solutions that can collectively combine. And then finally, um, with software development, um, we, we make it so that we can adjust it. You know, if you think about making something physical uh, in the real world, like, um, like a hammer, you, you make yourself a hammer and then it's a hammer. You can't really like sort of 
tweak it to be something else. You can't really turn it into a screwdriver. Software is completely the opposite. So this notion of agile allows us to uh, continually change things. So, um, you know, the, the contention here is the reason we have great software is because we, we have great software tooling. And that means thinking, object-oriented programming, reuse, abstraction, and, and agile. So we'll go in a little bit deeper here. So reuse, um, the idea is that it is uh, it makes no sense to build everything from scratch. If I were writing code, and I remember this, you know, back in back in um, high school, you, you're writing some code to do something. I was trying to center a string of text on the screen for my Tetris game. If you write it and you have to center it once, and then later you have to center it again by measuring how long the string is and putting it in the center of the screen, you actually move that into a function. So then you call that function everywhere you want to. It just makes tons of sense, right? Uh, this this idea that you already um, 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 streamline things, have a single copy of important stuff, and then reference that wherever possible. Now, refactoring quick, pretty quickly leads to uh, code snippets on the web, and then eventually formally including um, code in, and, and this happens in every single programming language with different methods. Include would be C++ or, or, or Perl or anything else like that. Uh, but you, you take someone else's fully fledged chunk of code and with by including this typing the sentence include that code it comes into your code now you don't have to rebuild it but what is important is you understand how it works what the inputs and outputs are uh there's um, a whole bunch of uh, npm is on here um uh, libraries to be able to pull in code and then um i think the next evolution of this which is where we are today is api so this means someone else uh, a company called auth zero has written code uh, I want to use it. I'm not going to download their code and include it in my code base. I'm just going to make a call as it's happening. So a live call out to Auth0, they're going to do something. They're going to send me some data back. So it is like separating the code. It allows me to stand on the shoulders of giants, but there's a really clear um, social contract, uh, an API uh, application programming interface that tells me how I can talk to Auth0 and how they can talk to me to make it successful. And I think this is a, a very uh, important accelerant to software development. Um, then um, the second piece of software development toolkit is that this idea that, that you know what, I'm not going to worry about it. You worry about that part, I'll worry about this part. Um, this, this is, um, I think, to me, best typified with how we're talking today. Um, my, uh, the program Zoom does not know, does not care if I'm on plugged in Ethernet, Wi-Fi, cellular, whatever. My program Zoom doesn't really care if I'm on a PC or a Mac, right? Uh, th th this is an important piece of the puzzle. I won't go through this picture, but this is how like every bit goes through the internet is that the Zoom, which is up here on the application layer, takes its data and puts it, people say an envelope, you put it into an envelope and then pass it to someone else. That means um, down here at the TCP layer, that takes the envelope, puts it in another envelope and sends it down and sends it down. But the idea is that nobody needs to know anything about it, what's above or what's below. And this is an important piece that you can see, you may recognize some of these protocols here on the right side, that Ethernet or Bluetooth down is here. So I could be, in theory, doing Zoom over Bluetooth and Zoom wouldn't care because it just puts something in an envelope. On the other side of the transaction, the envelope gets open, uh, the seven envelopes for the seven layers of OSI stack get opened. So um, critical piece of, of kind of how this works, um, it is based on a contract between components. You know, Zoom always knows this is gonna happen. They know this isn't gonna happen. An example of that is TCP is best effort, UDP, which is an alternative transport layer protocol here, uh, will doesn't have any guarantees. So uh, as long as you tell people what you're gonna do, now they can trust uh, um, you for what you promised. Uh, another evolution of this that's a little hotter these days is microservices, uh, where um, instead of building a large app, let's say like Facebook, you actually have thousands of small little services that run on their own. They can be written in different languages and they talk to each other. And that way, uh, one person doesn't have to open a gigantic code base. One person's not in charge. Everything has its own separate social contract. So we're going to see echoes of this just to, to hint at what's coming in um, with software beyond the screen. Uh, the last piece of software development that I'll talk about is, um, is, is kind of agile code, software beyond the screen, uh, smart course correction. Um, so um, uh, agile is, is a um, often used word, but I think it starts with this premise that if you're building something, you have no idea what the right answer is when you start. You're about to go on a journey and you don't actually know where the end point is, right? Um, and that's by the way, that's the opposite of most software development. The alternative to Agile is waterfall development, where you ask everyone what to build and you and you spend two, two years building it, um, uh, kind of like Microsoft uh, Office back in the day. So with Agile, instead, you say, I'm going to um, uh, 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 make a hypothesis, test, and iterate to figure out what is the right solution. I mean, it sounds obvious again today, but test, measure, and improve little by little to sort of find my way to the right place in the... Um, 
in the um, in the ecosystem, uh, the right way to product market fit so that I have the best product possible. It's a really important idea. It's, again, it's, I think it sounds obvious today, but it wasn't at all. Uh, and I think it doesn't apply to most products, right? Like the, the chair you're sitting on was not designed with agile, right? That somebody smart said, this is the right way to do a chair. This is how tall the armrest should be. This is how the how soft the back should be. If you think about it, that's ridiculous. The idea that like someone smart just said, this is how it is, as opposed to continually iterating and, and tweaking it. Now, um, again, getting jumping ahead, uh, alluding here, historically, you couldn't tweak your share. So somebody just had to take a guess. Uh, but um, now we might be able to do something better. A visual way to explain the same idea of Agile here is that um, with any project uh, or any trip or really anything you're going to do that's new, uh, at the very beginning, um, if you think about sort of time is the x-axis here, you don't know very much at the beginning and you know a lot at the end, right? That's a, that's a trivial line in many ways. Uh, but um, if you're starting a project like a software development project or starting a new business, you know the least at the beginning, but you actually have to make the most important decisions at the beginning. Right? You might have to select, are you going to use AWS or Google? Are you going to use Python? Are you going to use this library? Uh, are you going to hire these kinds of engineers or a remote team or experts with um, image manipulation? So when you know the least, you have to make the most important decisions. This is historically how it's been, um, especially when you do waterfall development. Now, the beauty of Agile is uh, the, the importance of decision line moves. So instead of uh, uh, making the most important decisions at the beginning, you can now make the least important decisions. Uh, you get to change your mind a lot. So as you learn more, you can make more important decisions. I think this is a beautiful uh, implication of um, agile software development. Um, another element of agile software development, something that you may or may not realize, um, almost every tool you use now does stage deployment where um, when they think of something new, Facebook or Spotify or Zoom, they do not roll it out to everybody in the world at once. They clearly test it inside their four walls. Uh, but then what they do is they roll it out to like 0.1% of their users. And they watch for a day or a week to see if anything funny happens, if it's, if it's getting the results they wanted. And then they'll roll it out to 1%. And then they'll roll it out to 10%. I think this is such a great way to do uh, QA, quality assurance, to, to check for issues by slowly rolling it out over time. And this is virtually everyone now. And, and that's a, a key piece of... Um, Stage deployment. There's a company launched Darkly that's fantastic at enabling this, the idea of using feature flags to slowly roll out what each customer sees. Um, so, um, you know, as I, as, I, as I think through this, um, I, I often think of this analogy, if you're building a new startup, writing new software, you're in a forest and uh, you don't know how to get out. Um, you're stuck in the center of it and, and you're trying to figure out. And um, one version of this is you're just brilliant and somehow you know the right way. Now, I, I don't back people like that. I don't know how that works. Steve Jobs was one of them, but that's very, very rare. If you're in the forest and you're trying to find your way out, which is a, a, an analogy for finding product market fit, I think you have to have signals. You have to have somebody um, saying hot or cold. Um, and so if you can get a hot or cold signal. Let's say a friend calls you and says, yeah, you're getting a little bit warmer or oh, you're getting a little bit colder every day. So you walk a whole day through the woods and then you find out you're cold and you gotta walk back. And then you walk a different direction you find out you're hot a day later. Now, what if your friend was calling you every hour or what if your friend was calling you every minute, right? Or let's say they just stayed on the phone with you. Every step you took, take one step forward, they're like, no, cold. You take a step back, you take another step hot. You're going to get out of the forest very quickly if you have that tight feedback loop with, uh, with kind of uh, high integrity, high fidelity signals coming at a very regular basis. And this is um, how all software works today. It was not how software worked in 2003 at Microsoft and um, historically wasn't that way either. The, having that, that great feedback loop to be able to test, measure, and improve is a really big part of this. So um, as we um, about to dive into to sort of the, the, the parallels here, um, uh, I wanna talk about the business aspect as well. So uh, before we get to software being on the screen, the elements of software I've told you about, which have been mostly from a technical perspective, do have business implications that are gonna be familiar to all of us. Today, when you buy something once, it just gets better, right? You, you, you um, pay for Zoom and we see this as annoying, but Zoom gets updates all the time and it's constantly getting better. Oh, new background features, oh, new blur features. Uh, that's a crazy thing that you pay for something and for some strange reason, it just gets better. Uh, maybe a, a, there's another example that's gonna show up in a minute, but just uh, here it is, the iPhone here. This idea that uh, Apple gives out iOS updates for free. So you buy an iPhone, it is expensive, a thousand bucks, but you continue to get free iOS updates. Um, uh, there are other tools. I'm a 
Creative Cloud subscriber with Adobe Photoshop. You used to pay 400 bucks for Photoshop on CD-ROMs in a box at Office Depot. Now you subscribe online. I think I pay $10 a month for Adobe Photoshop Creative Cloud. And it, I'm subscribing to the software and I'm always getting the latest version of the software. This is downloaded like four gig desktop software, but it is something where um, it's a totally different business model. Um, there are other things that end up happening downstream. So this idea that you can pay for something uh, use it for a while, then pay a little bit more for extra features. This is now coming to like cars, by the way, that you can now buy a car. Uh, I think Audi, among others, is pioneering here. You can buy a car and then push a button in the car and then get an extra feature like uh, self-driving or something downloaded. Um, I think um, on the flip side, if you're making a, a business, starting a business yourself, when you have these subscription revenue streams that come along with today's style of software, you know what revenue will look like longer into the future because you're not depending on episodic purchases, you're getting regular revenue, monthly payments, let's say. Um, there's also um, more um, of an interest as a developer. I'm not just trying to convince you to buy once. I'm, a, I'm trying to convince you to buy constantly, whether that's Photoshop, making sure that you pay your $9.99 every month, uh, or maybe... Um, where I want you to upgrade. If you a lot, there's a lot of free to play games right now, uh, and um, if you if you download one for free or pay pay once, uh, there's a strong incentive from the game developer to want you to explore more of the game, make more purchases during the game, uh, and that wasn't true in the past. It sounds obvious again today, but something like Doom or or Wolfenstein or any of those things, uh, you buy once, end of story. Five dollars, and then the developer kind of doesn't care if you use it again. So um, this actually, this core idea was, was part of one of the investments um, Angela mentioned earlier, Twitch, which is a, a, an investment where the company pivoted to Twitch. I handed them their term, first term sheet uh, nine months after they pivoted to Twitch. And Twitch was predicated on this idea that because of all these games that now have a business model where consumers will pay more if they play more, we want them to play more. We want them to see farther into the game. So Twitch lets you watch other people play video games. And that was a, an important implication from everything on this slide. So um, we're about halfway done. Uh, I think we're doing great on time. Uh, and uh, and now let's take all these ideas that we've, that we've built up here, some technical, some business ideas, and start to think about what that really means for, um, for smart hardware. So uh, let's see here. Let me just... Um, Pull up one last piece here. So um, we've talked about how software can jump off of the screen, right? Just this, this core premise that um, it has been on this onward march. Now, um, I think there's, um, we've also talked about this idea that, that there's a tool set with these three of, uh, three of there's probably more key elements here. But um, the, you know, my, my premise here is that um, the software development tool set has now become the hardware development tool set. We can use these I really don't mean hardware, I mean like real world development tool set. We can use these same ideas to now solve like everything around us. And I mean, I'm using my hands because it's physically. I don't just mean like um, using credit cards to buy clothes or something. I mean like the clothes, the mall, like the parking, like all sorts of physicality can now be addressed. Uh, and as a result, powerful tools, these software tools now can enable things like smart hardware. Um, so as I think about, um, you know, thinking about uh, the software beyond the screen, what is, what is smart hardware? We can use the historical um, guide uh, of software to, to um, decide. Um, so does something physical in the real world um, have the ability for someone to test its efficacy, measure, and then modify it, right? I, I gave you the example of a chair before. Um, take something fancy like a Rolex or an old Mercedes Benz, like, no, they don't have the ability to test, measure, or modify anything in there. Um, uh, if, it, if it did, this is what you look for. You look for flexible settings, dials and knobs. You know, I'm thinking about how on a Tesla, you can change the air suspension or you can change the drive mode. Um, on a Sonos speaker, I can turn it up and down with like digital buttons. Um, the, the, so the first piece is that a product has the ability to be modified. Um, Apple Watch, you can change the watch face um, and on and on. But if it has settings, that's the first piece of the puzzle. That's how um, things can be tested. Uh, those products need to have connectivity to send back usage analytics. Um, the ones I mentioned do, for example. Um, and then um, the developer needs to be able to push over their updates back to the product. So again, um, with the example of a Tesla, uh, they know how the cars are being driven, can understand that with their own analytics tools on their side, 
use that to reprioritize what features they're working on and then push those features out to all the Teslas, right? And that's a, a very important um, closed feedback loop that I think defines all software today and is now starting to define the real physical world. Um, so if you're ever wondering, you know, uh, is this software beyond the screen? I don't think looking for hardware is the right solution. It's more just, is this something in the real world where there's this feedback loop of settings, consumers, uh, users changing settings that is recorded with analytics that's sent to the developer that's used by the developer to push updates. So now you get something that gets better and better and better over time in a, a very real way. Um, you know, there are um, some, uh, this is a little bit of an old slide, but there's some core, you know, more, more tactical themes that are implicated by this, um, implied by this. So uh, one of them would be com putting computer vision um, everywhere. Uh, that means the ability for something to see, make a decision based on what's, what's in view. That used to be magic, and now for 200 bucks, uh, uh, and probably 200 bucks total in a waterproof enclosure, you can have something, look at something and make a decision. Here is an you know, example of a classifier with cars and trucks and things like that. Uh, little tiny GPUs, graphic processing units, um, and, and a few other things make this possible. But there's a lot of places where computer vision this is an area I'm actively investing in. Um, another area uh, that I think is made possible by this is no longer just telling what's going on, but also changing something. So I say, don't just sense, actuate. The, 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 um, I think there's a lot more budget if you can um, figure out what's going on, uh, diagnose it and address it. Uh, and so rather than just measuring the, the pressure of uh, oil pipelines, if you can actually trigger something to occur like in an HVAC system in a building, right? Closing the feedback loop. I think there's personally, I think there's 10X the budget for that. And it's now possible because of API standardization and, and some of the tools we talked about. So um, what I'll do for um, a little bit here is, is dive into a few examples. Um, some of it's from my um, investment work. Some of it will be outside of that. Um, and, um, and we can talk a little bit about what each, um, what each, each kind of um, means. So um, uh, let's see here. Let's talk about um, Halter for a second. So um, Halter is a company that um, is able to bring software very far from a computer, um, probably the farthest place I could, one of the farthest places I could imagine is on a big field of grass with hundreds of dairy cows um, for milk, um, no computers anywhere, no electricity anywhere, definitely no mice or keyboard, um, computer mice, there might be other mice, no computer mice. And so what, what I'll just put up here for a second is, is a picture of, um, of Halter, uh, just a, a quick snapshot of, um, of kind of what, what the company kind of looks like at some level. So, so the core idea is that Halter has this um, collar here on the, um, you can kind of see a little bit of it. There's a, a collar that, that goes around the neck of a dairy cow um, and it has batteries and solar panels. It can vibrate and it can play a sound. And uh, with those native functionality, you now can turn a cow into software. And I mean that relatively, like literally, um, you can write code that will move a cow. So you, you pick up your phone, you move your finger and a cow will move in the real world. You now have the ability to do digital shepherding. Uh, you have the ability to replace your physical fences on a dairy farm with digital fences. You have the ability to, to start to write interesting um, pieces of code. We call them cowgorithms instead of algorithms. You now can see of my 500 cows, which cows have not eaten that much today. Eating would be measured by the um, accelerometer tilt of a, of a head. Uh, which cows haven't been eating much today? Uh, let's take those five cows out of the 500 and take them to the next patch of grass so they can eat first. So I hope um, if you're like me, you know, when I first hit this idea, I just got tingles like, wow, the potential from just adding a collar, you now get the full addressability, extensibility, everything we talked about earlier, you know, test measure improve of software uh, far away from a computer in an area that's never had software before that clearly can benefit. Now, the um, numerical benefit here is uh, or the measurable benefit for a business perspective is you have better fed cows, better milk production, lower staff costs, and a few other things. Um, it also embodies a lot of um, software development uh, in the sense that, um, you know, Instagram might roll out a new feature. When we roll out a new feature, we, you know, we used to focus on moving the cows. Now we can do uh, heat detection. We can tell when a cow is um, in the, the right window of time to get pregnant. We can do health detection. We can do a lot of other things. We have a huge roadmap following. And so this will be true for, for a lot of the, um, a lot of, a lot of the ubiquity companies. Um, 
let's uh, jump ahead to to Rocket Lab for a second. So, um, Rocket Lab is a company that um, I first um, invested in with David Cowan in 2014, December 2014. We uh, uh, invested when the company had one rocket looks kind of like this and um and and uh yeah let's go deep on this for a second so every rocket you've ever seen um except rocket lab has a um, very complicated um you know the whole rocket all the complexity of a rocket almost all of it's down in the engine almost all the complexity of an engine is is in a turbo pump a turbo pump takes uh very cold fuel and um pumps it into the combustion chamber very, very quickly. Uh, it turns out it's very, very hard to do. Part of it is that um, the turbo pump is has a little engine inside to turn a, a turbine that's pumping the fuel. So you have this huge thermal gradient. But long story short, it is an extremely complicated piece of hardware. Think about that SLR photo I had uh, up on screen 20 minutes ago. So everyone else in the rocket world is using a mechanical uh, turbo pump and, and Peter Beck there on the, we'll see him again in a second. He had this, um, he had many innovations here, but one of the innovations was instead of using a mechanical turbo pump, let's use an electrical turbo pump. Now that might sound like a small thing. This is not an electric powered rocket. You don't plug it in, uh, but it has an electric turbo pump. That's what these red things are right here. So these red things, um, two, um, you can't see the other one, are electric uh, turbo pumps where you can change how they operate with software. Um, the mechanical turbo pumps, if you wanted to, if you're making a new engine, um, you would have to test it. If it didn't work, disassemble the whole engine, go back to the steel metal working shop, bend a new piece of steel, reassemble the whole engine, try it again. So your testing iteration loop is very expensive and long. With Rocket Lab, and I was there for some of this in, in Auckland during the early testing, you try something, it doesn't quite work right. You go back to a computer, open up C++, change one variable, and then you compile and run it again, right? So that's like super fast iteration. Again, just the, the, the heart of software will be on the screen. And so eventually nine of these rocket engines go onto a, um, an electron, and this has now been to orbit 30 times. The company's now a public company. But um, I will put in the chat um, a, a few blog posts, but there's a blog post that goes a little bit deeper into what made Rocket Lab special. But I still think of Rocket Lab as a, as a real software beyond the screen company. So um, let's keep going. Um, I'll bring up a few um, interesting examples of this. And you know, while I'm at it, why don't we just put um, some that, that uh, Rocket Lab uh, post in the uh, link here so you all can see. And then there's even um, uh, a memo about it. The best for investment memo is now public, but we'll share that in a minute. So um, uh, we'll, we'll go through a few more examples of the implications of software beyond the screen. I've talked a lot about Tesla today. Um, there was a very interesting development. Um, so Tesla, um, this is a, a few years ago, but things like this keep happening. Tesla has, um, there's two ways to look at it, by the way. Uh, Tesla has, um, let me tell the first story and then we'll get to this picture. Tesla uh, at some point had, um, I think four, uh, three models of the Model S. You could have the Model S uh, 80, the Model S uh, 60, and the Model S 40. And then that referred to how much power was inside, how much energy was inside, the number of kilowatt hours. So 80 kilowatt hours, and that would might take you three, 200 miles, 60 kilowatt hours might take you 150, and then 40 kilowatt hours might take you 100 miles. And so you can decide which one do I want. At the time, batteries were by far the most expensive element of the car. And so there was a tiering of different products. Now, uh, three products, if you're a business person, you're like, oh, shoot, now I got to build three products, keep track of three products, have an inventory of three products. So Tesla did not do that. They only had two products. They had a Model S80 and a Model S60. And what they did was in software, they limited how much of the battery pack you could access down to 40 if you bought a 40. That's either uh, intellectually interesting or offensive. You know, I've talked to a lot of people about this. Some people are like, what the heck? You're paying for a 60 pack and you're only getting 40? You're not paying for a 60 pack. You're paying for a 40 pack and you're getting what you think is a 40 pack. Now, I think that's an interesting idea to be able to dynamically shift inventory uh, based on um, software. But in, in because of that background I just gave you, this is what actually happened. There was a big hurricane in Florida and um, maybe to be nice, maybe as a publicity stunt, Tesla uh, unlocked the, the, I'm gonna get the numbers wrong here, but you get the idea, the 40 battery pack up to 60. So uh, with software, just for a few days or a few weeks, that way you could charge a little further and get the heck out of Florida, which I think is such an interesting idea of software tuning, changing our, our real physical world. Um, the Mars rover, I think this we, we've had um, another one, a more important one since with the helicopter and everything. But when we launch a rover to Mars, 
this is mostly a true story. We launch this beautiful physical thing. This thing's about the size of a Hummer uh, uh, vehicle. We launch it uh, without any software. So, so we launch it and because of orbital trajectories and home and transfers and this and that, it takes nine months or so to get to Mars. Uh, that means we have nine more months to finish the software, right? The physical rover is going to Mars. Uh, we can work until for like another eight and a half months, finishing the software, making it better, and then beam it over. It goes over at the speed of light, which is, which is uh, irrelevant uh, for this eight month window, nine month window. And, um, and, and this headline was another example of that. Even after it landed, they did an over the air update to improve it more and more. So this notion of software being on the screen is um, actually going beyond earth um, as well. But I think it's an important piece of the puzzle. Uh, one of the Ubiquity extended team members helped to write code that uh, uses machine le learning locally on the, the current Mars rover, the latest rover, Curiosity, to um, uh, determine if an image is, uh, if, if a set of rocks, if a landscape is unique or not. So they trained an autoencoder on existing Mars imagery. And then when they looks at a new piece of uh, imagery, it um, is able to run it through that encoder, spit out the prediction. And if the prediction is different than the actual image, it means it's looking at something novel. So it's a novelty detector using machine learning locally. So another example of software beyond the screen. Um, I think this is more just a theoretical question of like, you know, what does a blue screen of death, which uh, if you're, I think these still occur on Windows. They definitely happened a ton when I was, um, um, you know, um, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, this idea that you're just using a computer, then boom, it just freezes uh, in an irrecoverable way. What happens when software is sort of all around us? When your chair is running software and your chair blue screens? I don't know yet. Um, I have uh, investments that are, you know, around this core idea of stability for um, software beyond the screen. But I think it's an interesting that that's not yet solved. Um, um, uh, Netflix just released this very interesting documentary um, about the Boeing MCAS system. Uh, in short, uh, and I may write a blog post about this still, I'm very uh, intrigued, uh, annoyed, uh, pissed off, intrigued by this Boeing MCAS thing where they made the airplane, um, they moved an engine forward. Uh, to put a bigger engine on it, it changes center of gravity. They didn't want to retrain the pilots because it would take very long through the whole FAA process and they'd lose market share to Airbus. So they had a different plane, the 737 MAX. And in software, they decided to change what uh, a pilot, you know, if a pilot moves the joystick, uh, the stick this way, it doesn't quite do the same thing because software would tweak it a little bit to account for the change in center of gravity. I'm uh, butchering the story, but the core idea is Boeing inserted software didn't really tell anybody, didn't put it in the pilot's manual, didn't alert folks. And that's what killed like 400 people across two planes. So I think there are very serious implications about messing up software beyond the screen um, uh, and, 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 and using this new power we have um, for good. Um, so uh, another example, Eclipsium is a ubiquity portfolio company. They scan firmware. So not like the software on your computer, like Norton or McAfee or like Windows Defender does, but one level deeper, uh, your BIOS, your UFI, the, the, the firmware running on your network interface card, your NIC, uh, looking for viruses. And I think it's, it's an interesting new attack vector and Eclipsium is the leader, uh, world's leader in this category right now. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so, so I have other stuff to, to bring up if we have time, but I, I would like to switch to questions in just a minute. But what I hope I've conveyed to you, it really is that, that software is truly amazing. It's definitely moving beyond the screen. And if you're, uh, if you're anybody here, you're going to um, start trying, trying, trying to build something here, invest in this area. It's a very, very, very big deal. It'll have a very big impact on humanity. There's a, I, I'm in the venture capital business. I think there's a lot of money to be made here. And it really does um, ride on this core loop of settings, analytics, and updates being the, the virtuous loop of improvement that makes all this possible. Thank you so much, Sunil. Um, of course. Paul, I'm gonna, Paul, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Because I want to make sure it's 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 asked correctly yeah sure <clears throat> hey uh, so uh, kind of I, I totally agree with a lot of the things you're saying i think one of the concerns i've seen is uh two-pronged around privacy and providing that active feedback i have a tesla and i certainly have concerns myself about what tesla can do to my car after the fact mm -hmm. uh and and also i think that some companies don't do enough uh you know i know in like almost every software app you can opt out of providing that active feedback to the developer but they don't provide enough value to necessarily, for, at least for me, to want to provide that value. So I'd say, you know what, I don't want you tracking all of my analytics and usage. And I'm not sure what you're really doing with that. So I'm not gonna allow you to do that. <clears throat> and don't know how you counsel your company, companies on how they handle 
that privacy aspect, as well as how do they incentivize the consumer to want to provide that feedback so that they can get better features and other things. Because everyone says the same thing of, hey, you'll get better features if you provide this, but give me concrete reasons. Yeah. How do you incentivize your, your kind of companies to, to kind of do that? And, well, and I, I guess same, yeah. same kind of flip question of the growing concern that I've seen with people that like, especially with cars where you buy a device or a car, and then after the fact, the company might reduce your feature set and yeah. that concern because it's always connected with that active feedback. These are, these are great questions. Um, I can talk for a minute about them, but I think that the high level answer is it is the wild west in software beyond the screen right now. And um, we are discovering issues, problems, misaligned interests that might even result in new companies, right? I mean, like the idea of, of the physical chair is a gigantic ecosystem and we've already solved like a lot of the different problems, right? And but if you think about like, um, you know, the, the, the software defined chair, uh, which there are some, by the way, how do I know it's gonna work? What if the company goes out of business? What are they doing with my data? When they say upgrade, what if I don't wanna upgrade? You know, uh, do they know where I, you know, I, uh, the echoes of the questions you're asking. I would, I can speculate and you asked what I, what I coach my companies on. Actually don't do a whole lot of consumer smart hardware, by the way, a lot more as an enterprise smart hardware like Halter. Um, and I'll, and I'll put a, um, you know, a, a, a picture of um, the, um, the current ubiquity portfolio in the, in the chat as well. So you all can see that. But um, I think that um, what we really need here is um, wait there it's on the chat now. What we, I, I don't think the answers are terribly different than like normal software um, or really anything. Uh, if I'm going to ask something of you, I have to explain what I'm giving back to you. Uh, at the moment, some of the software beyond the screen is being adopted by um, early adopters who are willing to forego any logic there. I just really want the latest um, Philips Hue bulb. I don't care what they're doing with the data. Let's just click through the terms of service. Uh, but I think that will um, normalize as this stuff gets more and more penetrated that uh, there's enough competitors and enough, uh, there'll be more transparency demanded where you'll wanna know what am I giving to get what? Uh, you've seen this with the Facebook backlash and things like that. So I think it takes a little bit of time. I do think it's an interesting company I mean, company idea is, is how could you, and I've heard versions of this, but how could you audit what a piece of smart hardware is doing as a third party and, and, and share that with a business or consumer? Um, I think it's a, it's a, it's a really tricky element um, as, as to how, how to do that. Ideally, this idea of, of gating features, it's a business opportunity, right? You sell a product with a base set of features, you gate future upgrade features. I think that's interesting. It's unclear how to prevent, maybe it's lawsuits, uh, how you prevent someone, a, a developer from reducing features over time, you know, without um, below what they promised you, right? That's like lawsuit worthy, I think. Um, there was a second part to your question, Paul. It wasn't just about privacy. It was about something else as well. That, that's kind of the second part was really, okay. you know, like Tesla be kind of got, Tesla got sued because it kind of to your example of them uh, having a nice PR stunt, right? And and again, I've, I've had a Tesla for many years, so I'm, I'm a fan, but I'm also a critic of them. Yeah. And I think that's one area where they have done things where they have reduced battery capacity because some cars might have been, uh, you know, up against their battery warranty. And they, you know, I think that this lawsuit alleged that they, uh, had some fires in China and they were worried. And so they reduced battery capacity and they wound up getting sued. And then they had to go back through and, uh, you know, had, they had a, uh, some, some judgment levied against them. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think you may be right that maybe lawsuits will ultimately kind of be what levels the field so that, uh, well, companies decide they can't do that. Like they can't come out and, and start messing with the base level feature set that they promised. But I think that's that's one of the concerns that I've seen with um, especially very expensive things like a car, um, as everything's getting that online all the time capability and firmware updates. Mm -hmm. uh, you always have to look through and say, what's the change log on this firmware? Do I really want to apply it, or did they reduce my acceleration, or you know because they found some other issue? Um, yeah. That kind of stuff. But yeah, yeah. I, I think you kind of already addressed that part too. No, I, mean, I mean, this is an entrepreneurial group. I, I think there's opportunities for. Um, you know, ex explaining to consumers what updates are. There could be a company around that. I mean, there's there's versions of that for normal desktop software. I think um, uh, it's a yeah. That's an interesting aspect of right having a third party company trying to monitor all of these different services and providing yeah. feedback. That's I mean, in in many ways, there's some parallels to like what um, Red Hat does with like open source Linux, and then they sort of fork it, not fork it, they, they stamp it as approved and, and include a little more enterprise support so that 
yes, you can use something that could be a little wild west, but trust it more because of that overlay. But I think there's, um, you know, another element is uh, the volume of updates as somebody that has like every gadget known to man, the number of updates is mind blowing and, uh, and exhausting. Uh, and I think at the moment, there's no um, natural uh, trend to prevent the new startup from pushing an update to my my Aura Ring every like week or my Apple iPhone or my LG TV, uh, which keeps asking, I agree with you, keeps asking like, hey, we'd really like to monitor what you're watching to improve your experience. And, I'm, and I say, no, I don't want that, but I, you keep getting, so there, there's, there's a lot to be solved here, a, a whole lot to be solved. I, as a venture capitalist, look at that as like, wow, there are going to be some great companies um, fixing all this stuff. I'm going to jump in here uh, because I want to let a couple other people ask questions. Mm -hmm. Uh, Clay asked, would love to hear you to elaborate on how you achieve conviction when valuing a potential investment that is often just an idea. Hmm. That's a great question, Clay. Thanks for, thanks for asking. Um, so um, I, I would, I, I, I came up with a set of three questions, like in the first year or two of being a VC, and I found they've still been really useful, like as I've um, uh, changed focus and this and that. They're like, I think, pretty broad questions that work just about anywhere. Uh, and they're relatively simple. Um, I've used a little bit of jargon today, but in general, I hate jargon. I think uh, it can often be used to like hide behind when you don't really know something. So so I'll, I'll use um, the three simple questions that go through my mind every time I hear a pitch. I hear about 500 to 1,000 pitches a year for about 30 minutes. I pick about five to invest in. So I currently have a portfolio of 33 companies. Um, uh, with 100 million under management. And against that backdrop, like the way I picked those 33 portfolio companies is that I'll ask myself three questions. One, does anybody want it? Number two, are there a lot of those people? And number three, can this entrepreneur find them? Right? So, so you pitch me your new idea. Let's say you have a new idea for an autonomous lawnmower, right? A lawnmower that's going to mow lawns um, by itself. I, uh, the, the worst thing I could do as a VC, and this is very common in venture capital, the worst thing I could say is, uh, I don't think I'd ever use it pass, right? That's a terrible way to be a venture capitalist. Uh, but if you use my, my relatively simple framework, does anybody want it? I'm going to ask you, why do you think people want this? And you could say, well, Gartner report says, blah, blah, blah. I don't care about those. Usually if you say, Hey, I went around my neighborhood, asked 50 of my neighbors, and like five said, they'd really want this. That's a really big deal to me. And this, I'm a big subscriber of the Steve Blank Lean, Lean Startup Customer Development Methodology. Uh, if you get out of the building and talk to customers, that really helps answer my first question. Does anyone want this? You and I can debate if people want it. I hate that debate. What I'd rather prefer is you've gone out there and get a high fidelity customer signal. And that can be theoretical. Hey, if I built this, would you use it? Or it could be that you have a waiting list. You've taken credit card orders or something, but um, that's the single most important thing. And as a pre-seed investor, where I'm investing in, um, companies that are um, about a third of my investments, I invest the day they're incorporated, the rest within about six months or a year. Uh, that's the main signal I'm looking for is customer demand. Does anybody want it? Are there a lot of those people? The second question, it, it really is a little bit nuanced because it has to do with how, where you're going to focus your product. You could say in Texas with this regulation, with yard of over two acres, people love it. I'm like, great. Okay. How many of those are there? But then if you say, well, it also works for apartment communities. It also works in New York. It also works in other countries. You're slowly expanding your uh, market size. Sometimes people say total addressable market, your TAM. Uh, but um, does anyone want it? Are there a lot of those people? That's usually 95% of my work The at the pre-seed stage. The last question, can you find them? That really gets to um, uh, unit economics. How much does it cost for you to acquire a customer, the cost of uh, cost to acquire a customer, your CAC, C-A-C, and how much in gross profit will you generate from them over time, your lifetime value? Uh, and in a very simple, you know, if it costs you $100 to acquire a customer and you only get $90 of lifetime value, LTV from them, that's not a good business. Ideally, you'd have um, a multiple. So you'd get a $500 of lifetime value versus $100 CAC. So that's usually a series A or a series B question. I'm a little bit earlier, but those are the three questions I ask. Um, uh, ask myself when it's really a more technical idea. I ask myself question zero, which is, does it work? You know, can this person, uh, an investment I did not too long ago can see around corners, right? So physically impossible, but they can do it. How does it work? Does it work? Do they have the credibility to make it work? Do they have proof it works? But that's question zero. And I don't usually have to ask that that much. Um, just listening to you talk, a question I have is, um, Okay, so we're at Rice University. Most of us probably go to school in some way. It just really stands out the future. You need to understand software. You need to understand hardware. You need to understand business. Um, and well, 
Hey, do you have a recommendation? Any recommendations for trying to navigate all three of those worlds? Because I, I don't think it's just a VC thing. I think it's an everybody thing. Mm. Uh, hi, Kevin. the The recording will be on YouTube. We have a channel, Ken Kennedy Institute. Hmm. Um. So, uh, I'm. Um, hope you don't mind me continuing to recommend blog posts. So, I, I yeah, did then. write a blog post about one element of what you just said. It was called "Staying Nerdy During the Pandemic." I think I wrote it. I don't even know when exactly. Let's see here. I wrote it in May, so two months into the pandemic. Uh, and um, what I was recommending there was, was in short, YouTube. YouTube is a shockingly valuable, uh, and I really mean that, shockingly valuable place to learn um, um, uh, any number of topics. Um, I, uh, myself, if you, if you left me alone, I'd have some popcorn watching some nerdy science YouTube about a new technology or, or math theory or something like that. And I listed some of my favorite YouTubers on that blog post right there. Um, now, it's, it does have some practical um, implications. So I think the three blue, one brown, one of my favorite YouTubers, has the, one of the world's best explanations of what machine learning really, really, really means. Uh, and, uh, and it takes 20 minutes and you'll have like a better working knowledge than most people who say the word machine learning. And I really mean that. So I think um, looking to YouTube for different technical topics is a way to, to get up to speed. Um, Angela, you also mentioned the business side of things. You know, as somebody that straddles both worlds, I do think the, the basics of business are much easier to uh, learn than the basics of engineering. I think it's generally harder to be an engineer than it is harder to be a business person. Um, now, uh, where to learn those basic business concepts, that's a good question. Um, I, I have a sense that if you poked around on YouTube and watched five videos about different topics, you'd have a better sense of uh, or even I think business might even just be reading for a little bit on, on the web, but uh, so basic topics, there's probably five or 10 that come up, things like revenue, profit, gross margin, customer acquisition cost, CapEx, capital expenditure, um, IRR, internal rate of return, um, pre-money valuation, post-money valuation. So uh, maybe um, Venture Hacks is one that was particularly good for the startup world. Um, the, um, um, Naval, who started uh, AngelList, put this together. So I'll put that in the, in the chat as well. That had like 50 different blog posts about different business topics to help get you up to speed. I like to look at pitch decks because I think mm -hmm. that covers a mm -hmm. lot of those things. And when you get a chance to like look at a dozen of them together, you start seeing the patterns. Mm -hmm. But I, I, when I, I knew what your answer was and I, that's why I asked you. Oh. <laughs> I remember from last time. Okay, so uh, Bill, um, you know what, Bill, will you unmute yourself and ask your question? I wanna make sure it's asked correctly. Sure, does that work? Yes, yes. you're good. Yeah, I'm just a little concerned on these uh, analytics feedback loops catching signals which turn out to be detrimental. Mm. Um, I don't have any examples, but I think it's very much in the realm of possibility. I'm just concerned, where's the liability? Who's, who, who becomes a gatekeeper? Does it become a regulatory issue? Is it, uh, you know, what's happening to Facebook now? Where's the, where's that get regulated? Yeah, a very good question. And you you mean um, for like privacy when you say detrimental? No, I mean culturally detrimental. I mean, in my example, I said, suppose Tesla somehow uh, had features that were very appealing to drug runners. Um, I don't know, some acceleration or private, you know, mm -hmm. hey, I can stealth my Tesla or whatever. And mm -hmm. these features started with um, all the drug runners. And I said, I'm going to get a Tesla. And then those features started to multiply in their favor. It's a crazy, mm -hmm. it's a crazy example, but. Um, yeah, it's an interesting idea because a, a lot of what I'm saying is um, we can accelerate the pace of innovation that makes it to the end user. Um, we can give people what they want quicker. Um, and you're, I'm hearing your point is sometimes people want bad, uh, uh, um, I'm say evil, because they're not like um, badly executed things. They're like evil things or good things. I don't know. That's a very good, very, very good question. Um, um, I'm guessing regulatory. I definitely think regulatory has not caught up with smart hardware or, or a lot of these software began the screen ideas, but there does need to be that. I, I do think there's a different element of like, you probably heard these machine learning um, often, you know, you train it on good data, uh, known good data, and then it tries to match that known good data. And there are elements where like, I think Google had a horrible uh, screw up where they were like, 
recognizing people that were like a certain race as gorillas, right? Like that's like fucking awful. Like I mean, I'm using the cuss word on purpose because Google engineers should have done better. And like, uh, and so if we if we mindlessly apply technology like this, it can be awful, right? Like terrible. And so I I still think we need. I don't know yet. Basic is the answer build to your question, but we do need to put these things in place to have checks at different parts of the process. Um, now, if you're doing a machine learning model with image recognition, you actually think about data balancing and you do some QA and testing to make sure that it's not spitting out nonsense or, or, or repeating biases or something like that. But uh, I think it's open area for exploration. Um, just kind of a, a thought, do you, because you came from a technical background and then got an MBA, do mm -hmm. you recommend that? Uh, yeah, I, I, I thought it was great, but um, I think uh, it was... Uh, something where I found um, business to be very intimidating as an engineer. Um, and um, it was one way to solve that was to just learn it properly. And now I find that um, hearing about business topics no longer holds power over me, if that makes sense. I don't know if that'll resonate with some of the engineers here, but when I was an engineer and someone said PL, I was like, what does that mean? Is that a different kind of API or a new language I don't know about? Or is it a new manufacturer? It's like, no, it's it's a, it's a sheet of paper that says I got this much revenue, I spent this much and I have this much in profit. That's what a PL is. So uh, I found it helpful. Now, I think that there are probably quicker ways to gather that kind of basic business knowledge that might um, solve that problem. But I, I found it to be very helpful for my interests and passions. But um, okay. Angela, I have to say um, thank yeah, you to yeah. all for um, having me here. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's so an honor much. to talk to more folks. I do hope some of you will sign up for office hours. Um, I, I, I'm doing this talk to uh, evangelize software beyond the screen, but also to bring new investments into Ubiquity. So I would love to fund more folks from the Rice community if I could. Yeah. So my email thank address, so I can even put it in the chat, but it's just Sunil at Ubiquity. So feel free to yeah, reach and out. Everybody, the um, talk will be on our YouTube channel. So you can, if you missed any part of it, you can go back and watch. Thank you so much. Cool. See you soon. Thank you, everybody. Bye.